better never ends. In health, in performance, no matter your starting point, you can always strive for better. My name is Charlie Goodchild, I'm your host, and this is the Better Never Ends podcast. We've made it our mission to share with you the expertise and wisdom of role models and leading experts in their field, teaching us about how we can be better, telling stories about their journey to better, and inspiring you to discover yours. So today we've got Anisha Joshi joining us for a podcast and she's sitting in front of me now and she's in a rush because she's always in a rush. She's, we've got a, a very specific amount of time today because she's off to another very important meeting. So um, Anisha is a, an osteopath. She's a business owner. She's a TV personality. Am I, dare I say it? Can I, uh, can I, say I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call myself a TV yeah. personality. But you're on TV. So you've done some TV work. You're an author now, which we'll come to. Uh, and you're, you're, you're a woman of many talents is, is something I've picked up on since our conversation. So we started speaking a few months ago since we both joined at Until in central London. Um, and as fellow business owners, I think we were quite interested by each other's journeys. Mm. And the more we spoke, the more we thought, huh, actually, let's, let's do this on a podcast. So that's where this came from a few months back. Is there anything I've missed? What, what else is there about you that the audience should know about? I mean... I feel like you pretty much got it. Yeah. yeah. Like I'm impressed because we, a few months ago, that was, was it a few months ago? Yeah. It was some, uh, some maybe autumn, yeah. summer last year. Yeah. 2023. Yeah. So yeah, it was, um, it was an interesting chat about mm. our sort of, I guess, our journeys into um, our professions, mm. our business, and also kind of, I guess how we got there in our our backgrounds. Yeah. So tell us about yours then. That's what that's what I want to hear today. <laughs> tell us about your journey into osteopathy first of all. I guess. Um. Yeah. Sure. So uh, I uh, decided to do osteopathy because my sister is an osteopath as well. Um. So it wasn't. It wasn't really. I, I I'm like it was not her. Yeah. But it, <laughs> it <might> was. <laughs> yeah. Probably. Uh. So my dad needed back surgery and uh he then went to see an osteopath and he uh got better and so my sister did it and then I think so there's a seven year age gap between us um sorry Reen and uh, because of that it I think I sort of could see the benefits um and how rewarding it was uh, so I decided that it might be a good idea to have a look into it. Um, I tried to not do it because I didn't want to copy her. Mm. And then she sat me down and was like, do you know what? Why are you trying to not, like, why are you trying to fight it? Yeah. Um, just do it. So I did. And um, I've loved it. And I never really set out to sort of, you know make osteopathy more well known or be that osteopath that goes on tv or you know does podcasts for instance um I genuinely just wanted to treat patients um empower them make them feel better and live their best life and then it kind of just organically happened um where I just kept getting the same message over and over again um from patients from external people as well just kind of saying you know you're quite relatable and stuff like that you know maybe you should think about doing something on instagram Mm. Um, and that's kind of when it kicked off when was that how long ago was that probably about seven years ago and since then i are you comfortable with trailblazer <laughs> you know treading treading a, a path of you know really shouting and promoting your world and your and, and your profession um spreading the good word i mean i'd love to think that was the case mm. <laughs> um i think there's a few of us now which is great and mm. i think that there needs to be that's my biggest thing is i have absolutely no intention of being that one person that stood at the top of the mountain on my own. You know, I want to be there with everyone because a view is so much nicer when you're sharing it with other people. Very nice. And thank you. (laughs) Um, And, you know, it's... And so I'm constantly just, 
encouraging young osteos, other osteos to to do the same if they if they want to do that, if they want to get on TV, if they want to um, do more things on Instagram and um, but yeah, it's tough. It's tough to sort of feel firstly if that's what you want to do, and secondly, there can be a bit of you know unfortunate trolling as a consequence of it as well. What kind of stuff have you had? Um, so I've had um quite a few uh sort of osteopaths when I sort of first started to put my head above the parapet. Um say things like oh I wouldn't have said that I wouldn't have said that for neck pain or um you know that's not quite right or you know all these things um and and you know I I know it's happened to other people so I know that there are others before me that sort of had gone on tv and had been shot at as well um I think the difference with I'm hoping myself is that I've really firstly rather than giving up and going oh my god I'm really scared I don't want to do it anymore firstly I've I've sort of gone okay um I'm devastated because I'm trying to do this for the profession and go out my comfort zone and every time I do it I'm absolutely shitting myself and secondly um I want to learn like so what what am I saying that's wrong let's have a chat let's have a zoom call like you don't need to be mean how does that go not one of them has had a zoom call with me i think that's the the problem and that's that kind of keyboard <laughs> warrior thing isn't it it's like yeah if you've got something to say then be willing to have a conversation about it because yeah. i think both of us are similar in that just because i have an opinion it doesn't make it right i'm i'm completely fine with someone else thinking differently to me and actually I welcome it I think is a really good thing yeah and I'm sure as we go through today's chat we might even have something we disagree on or something that you say and oh, it's not quite the way I do it actually yeah. it's interesting but we can have a conversation about it and, and listen to someone else's opinion but if someone's going to make you feel the way they made you feel just because they don't agree with you but they're not willing to be brave enough to talk about it then I don't I don't see what value that brings to anything other than yeah. them just being mean yeah exactly and I struggled with that for a while um, and, you know, it led to panic attacks and yeah. all kinds of things um, where I needed a lot of help and therapy. And, you know, yeah. my therapist was like, you know, sometimes people just don't want to like you, yeah. <laughs> you know, regardless of what you say, what you do, they would just, they probably know that by talking to you that you'll probably, that they'll end up liking you. <laughs> You know, like that, because because I genuinely want to do a good job, right? Like, I don't want to sit on TV and say the wrong thing. Of course, I don't. You know, I I genuinely want to impact people's lives, and so I'm like, let's chat. Like, what did I do wrong? I want to learn. You know. Um. So anyway, there there were lots of people that did chat to me, and consequently, I have learned, and I have had to shift the way the the advice I give and stuff like that because it is it is a minefield out there um you've got to put some armor on haven't you every time you go on do these things put yourself out there you've got to be willing to to take it and and not take it to heart so that must be really tough yeah I think skills that you've learned over probably by not knowing how to do it if you had to learn those skills yeah like I definitely had to learn how to do it um it and even you know, I've done, I've done this morning now like 10 times or something. And still every single time I go on, it's like an entire week of mental preparation, Mm. um, of power posing and like strutting down my hallway at my home. And even when I get to the studio, I make the woman in the green room power pose with me and she thinks I'm an absolute loser. (laughs) But it works for you. I think so. I mean, I, I still, like I said, I still absolutely shit myself yeah. um, and get the adrenaline rush and the heart rate, which yeah. I've learned how to sort of distract myself. Um, things like um, just before, you know, as they're sort of saying my name, I, my heart rate goes up and I always panic that it's going to be a full blown panic attack. Yeah. Cause that's what happened to me. It was actually like right before I went live on TV, my wow. first ever panic attack. 
Um, so now I've got this trick. And I actually tell my patients this as well. So if they're starting to, I say, if you're getting stuck in your head with your thoughts, with your pain, and you feel yourself going down a bit of a spiral, a negative mm-hmm. spiral, then I want you to think of a color wherever you are, um, at home, on the tube, at work, think of a color and then start counting how many things you can see that are that color. So that's really worked for me. So I'll be sat on the sofa at this morning going green, one, two, in my head, obviously. So it's it's basically trying to, uh, something super simple in the present, in the moment, in the now, take you away from those feelings of worrying about the future, what might happen, worrying about the past, what, what's already happened. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really simple, but I imagine really effective way because no matter where you are, there's colors, there's <laughs> things to count. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sorry if you're color blind, but like it's, you know, there's, there's things you can, yeah, there's things you can count and it, it works. Like there are times when I'm, you know, on the tube and it's really, really packed. And sometimes I sort of, remember you know that um like I suddenly get a little bit panicky right like for no reason and I will just start counting colors like what people are wearing like their shoes and you know it just and before you know it, you're at your station so it really brings that sense of calm to you hmm. how did you when that when it happened the first time around did you have that Thing to lean on then or was that something you learned that's something afterwards? I learned so what yeah. happened in that moment what 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 was the consequence of that for you um so when it happened it was I was literally stuck on the sofa with a producer behind the camera live tv yeah yeah and he was going he was like are you all right because I basically started to physically shake yeah like so I started to feel really cold I thought I was going to throw up. I was. I felt really nauseous. It was a whole fight or flight mm. in full blown. My body thought there was a tiger ready to go. Yeah. And um, I essentially, I just, I think I, I, I just talked to myself in my head. I kind of just went like, okay, Anisha, you just have to get, because at the moment it happened, I only had to say two two sentences because it was the intro to the show. Mm-hmm. And then I was coming back on two hours later. Okay. So I was like, just get through two sentences and then it's fine if you throw up everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, just, just two sentences, Alicia, it's fine, right? So I just was like, and obviously it's like awful because there's producer there going 10, 9, Hey, and you're going like, I can't vomit, nine seconds of vomit <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah anyway so I got through the two sentences yeah. didn't throw up everywhere but I was literally like had no idea what had just happened I was like yeah. what is that um and then I had to go back on and I managed to get through it and I ended up having PTSD because I you know from being stuck about to go live in front of 1.8 million people um, and started getting panic attacks everywhere. So it was on the tube, having coffee with a friend, going to bed. Like I'd literally be lying in bed and I'd suddenly be like, I'd feel my heart go and I'd be like, oh my God, I, I can't breathe. I can't, you know, so I had intensive therapy. Mm. Um, like I think it was twice, three times a week. Could could someone have noticed that you were going through that at the moment when they when I don't know if you've w- watched it back necessarily or someone else that you know did they say oh you know are you okay or like it looked really tense looked really stressed um, or did you manage to put on a face I so I've had my family watch it back and they said you can notice right at the beginning uh, before mm. I start speaking that I'm shaking but the minute I start speaking. It's like I'm normal, yeah. basically. And I think that's what's so fascinating is that we can somehow get through those moments somehow, you know, yeah. the, the, probably completely unfeasible 10 seconds before and then you get through it. Yeah. Yeah, the people you love probably noticed, but actually you 
probably managed to figure it out and yet under the surface there's all these, these other things going on your body's going absolutely nuts and yeah wanting to run away from the tiger and, and you're there and delivering something yeah i know it's it's mad it's amazing how how amazing our bodies are and that seems to have taught you really big lesson in in a way of of how your body reacts to certain things and how you then manage it i guess did you did you know that about yourself before definitely not like i i honestly was like this doesn't happen to me like i am not this person i've you know me and my sister used to do dances together yeah. at indian weddings um if you know you know and <laughs> and you know th these weddings 700 people right and yeah, I used to get a bit nervous, but I, I would like to think that I was okay with performing, yeah. you know? So for me, I was like, no, 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 this is not the time. Like this is, I've wanted to get on this show for eight years. Mm. <laughs> this is not the time. Um, Cause the interesting thing is if, if it was happening to me, I'd be like, right, I know I, I'm totally expecting this to happen. I, I know what's gonna happen. I'm gonna feel that nerve, that nervousness come up. So I, I spoke at a conference last year for the first time and I was already a bit nervous about it because I know that in front of a big group of people I'm I get pretty tense and I get and I know that the first minute or two is going to be a bit mumbly and I'm a bit bumbly all, all over my words and lose track mm. of things it gets really too stimulating for me and then I can ease into it and then I relax and, I, and I, that's been how it's been all through my life delivering presentations to a class delivering to a team meeting whatever it might be I've always known that about me. Mm. it's just something I've been able to work through yeah but before this conference that I was delivering I managed to get a sore throat which meant I could barely talk and I was I was had I was like oh, I've got to deliver it because I've promised it I've set up pre I've prepped for it I could really I was hardly getting words out at all in the morning and I knew my talk was like the afternoon and I was thinking well if I can just get some form of words out by mid-morning maybe I'm okay and that happened so I was like okay right so I won't cancel yet so I'm slurping drinks I'm putting medicine in me trying to get just about by the time I started there it was just croaky but I was there and like the probably the most nerve-wracking thing I've done in a while and I can barely talk I'm thinking god I'm really the the absolute bad timing of this mm. and the whole thing is a blur I'm, I don't really know how it went I imagine it went really badly actually I can't I don't really know but I know I got through it and I know I somehow managed to yeah. get through the 40 minutes sort of croaking my way through it and um, yeah pretty traumatizing event but I kind of almost was I knew that might happen because I'd had it and then it made worse but it's really interesting that you've yeah. never had any signs of struggling with anything you know mm. any kind of performance anxiety because I, I know I get that whereas by the sounds of it you never had it and, and there it yeah, I mean, almost. I mean, there, obviously there's that natural adrenaline rush. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I know that the one thing that was different about, so I'd been on the show once <laughs> and it was the second time I went on and it was after the first time I went on that I got all the hate okay. from osteopaths. Yeah. Um, only osteopaths, unfortunately. So the um, public, the people that you were talking to, actually, they received it really well. Yeah. By the sounds of things, they were asked you back as well, so they must have liked what you did. Yeah, and and it was a three week gap between the first mm. one and the second one, right. and um, that that was the only difference. So I think that that obviously, well, I mean, obviously, I have a bit of imposter syndrome. So you know, you already are like, oh, do I deserve to be here? Mm. And then if someone tells you you don't deserve to be there then you're like, oh, am I good enough? You know, and then it just comes up even more. There's a lovely um, part from, I think it's from Adam Grant's new book. I haven't read the book yet, but I've seen a couple of things on Instagram. And he says that imposter syndrome is where we don't believe in ourselves, but other people do. And that's why we're in the situation in the first place, because other, <laughs> other people believe you can do it. And that's why they asked you back. Yeah. Yet we still have the cheek to say that we don't believe in ourselves, even mm -hmm. though everyone else around us can see the potential. Yeah. It's a really nice moment. Like, oh yeah, that is a really obvious thing it's like, yeah, so that, true that makes so much sense like everyone else can see it and we don't believe it yeah that is that's actually really good well now that you've been on so many times you, you've clearly hardened up to some of that the, the trolling i guess from that from the osteopaths but why, why do you think you get it from osteopaths in particular what is it about the, the things that you're saying that seems to be so controversial to um osteopaths? i think i think prior I think when I first started, it was essentially I was giving out information 
and going on TV and like I put my hands up and and I'll say that it was coming from a place of what I'd learned at university. Now, we now know that that wasn't necessarily extremely evidence-based um, back in the day when I was at uni. Wow, I sound old. <laughs> but it's, I think, you know, they had, they had a fair point. You know, there were some things that I was saying that I learned at uni that I understood as being true, you know, because that's what I was taught. And so, um, and so when I, so I was essentially saying things that weren't accurate. Do you, have you then reflected on it and, and sort of changed your own views then even from? Huge shift. From there? Absolute massive shift. So from the, from that point, you know, I've spoken, tried to speak to these people. Um, every single one that was horrible to me refused to speak to me, yeah. but there are a lot of people that were really kind and you know I've I've spoken to and um, you know they they sort of were like look can see what you're trying to do but you know look at this and look at that and I was like okay and so I learned I learned and you know I made sure that the information I was putting out on Instagram when I go on TV I corrected the producers at this morning and I was like I'm not saying that because it's not true that's so interesting that you went through that traumatic event and it would have been much easier to just stick to your guns and gone, no, nope, this is what I said and I believe in it and that's 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 where I am and stay in that comfort zone almost. But you, you've you seen an opportunity to learn instead and gone out, been uncomfortable again and engaged in a learning process and now changed your mind entirely. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's something to be said about adapting and you know, yeah, like, it's okay to put your hands up and go and take accountability and say, actually, do you know what, these guys were, they were right, they were right, they weren't nice about it, (laughs) you know, and they could have been a bit more kinder and known that I'm a human, uh, and I'm not trying to get famous, and actually, I wasn't sat there saying I was the best osteopath in the world, Um, but it, you know, they, they did, you know, I, I, I ended up, there was like, there's a Facebook group and I, I actually thanked them. And I said, you know, thank you for opening my eyes. Um, And and I'm hoping that now they're looking at my content and stuff and thinking, okay, you know, we. I hope they've thought about their actions. Mm. So you also have a, a business. So as much as you're an osteopath and you still treat, I understand you're still busy uh, clinically and you still treat lots of patients, but you're running a business as well. And but how did that come about? And how many, you, what's your team look like at the moment within your business? So um, I own uh, Osteo Allies Clinic with, which is like the umbrella, the umbrella group with my sister, uh, who's Rena. And it consists of three clinics, one in London, one in Surrey, one in Hertfordshire, in Hitchin. And essentially we merged our businesses when COVID hit uh, because it was, uh, I nearly lost my business basically completely because my I conveniently kind of fell through the loophole of the government grant. Um, so in merging, we were able to save my business and, um, And it's, yeah, it's been really amazing because we've got a team of, it's multidisciplinary. So, you know, massage therapists, reflexologists, acupuncture, um, osteopaths, obviously. And it's nice. It's nice to be able to provide wellness. And when you've got a team around you, do you still have that sense of learning off of them and and you know, them learning from the team around them. Because I, I know that when I've ever been practicing on my own, it's, my learning slows down without doubt. And now I really always encourage anyone that's a clinician to try and work with a team one way or another, or at least have a mentor. So is that one of the one of the things that you find? Yeah. So we've, well, we've got, um, <coughs> my sister is a clinical director. So um, her main role is ensuring that our team are sort of 
constantly learning, being the best version of themselves. Um, she's managed to, she she's created a whole skills matrix and then asks the team where they want to, where they feel like they'd like to learn more. We take, we bring in sort of external speakers, um, but also have like micro CPD sessions in each clinic um, where people can, you know, discuss cases and things like that, um, as well as one-to-one -one mentoring. And I think that that's um, really important. I think we're now, at, we're, we're, I was going to say we're of that generation, but I don't actually know how old you are, so. I'm 36. Oh, oh man. You older than me. Yeah, I'm 38. <laughs> God. I look way younger though, everyone. Yeah, 28. Thanks. <laughs> I'll pay you later. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's, in, I, I feel like uh, the the new generation expect a level of support and mentoring. And I think this is a good thing. Yeah. So I've heard people complain about this. It's like, oh, they're so needy. They want this, they want that. It's <laughs> like, well, they're just asking for stuff that makes their life better. Mm. I don't have a problem with that. I think that we should be able to provide as business owners a, a level of um, happiness within their life or professional satisfaction, some autonomy, some flexibility. Now, maybe some businesses can't offer that, which that's fine, but I think if we can, then we should. Because yeah. If we can make people's lives better, yeah. they'll probably stay with us a bit longer anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so to me, it seems sensible as a business to to offer those things or to at least try and, and offer those things where possible. So yeah. I, I think we're probably aligning on the same thing there, but in, in a good way, rather than seeing it as a negative. It's like, oh, maybe we should just see this as a positive change in generation. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think that, you know, they're, they're on to something because I mm. think that possibly previously it would be more that someone would want though, that support just not say anything mm. then resent it Completely. and then just leave yeah you know That's and you'd be like why did they leave mm. they didn't tell why are they going you know but and then you find out later that they just wanted a bit of advice on case history so also, and you're just yeah. like i would have done that for you yeah they just cared <laughs> they just wanted to be thought about as an individual yeah and so not it's just a, a cog in the system yeah and it and it's good that um mm. yeah this new generation are just saying what their needs are and how else do we think about that, you know, from a business perspective? Because I, I, I definitely think there's there's a lot to it now. Is it? And, and it really takes some time, actually, to get to know people and, and really understand what people want and, and how best to get the, how you get the best out of people. What, what other things do you think are important around that as a business owner? Well, Maybe as a human as well. You know, what, what kind of things should we be doing as a human? As a human? Yeah. Um, I think... I think it's important to understand what makes people tick. Um, we, when we hire now, we have a full kind of onboarding process. We send out personality tests and things like that. Um, and that's before they get the job as it were. And that's not, that's not to sort of judge their personality and then be like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's actually. We don't take introverts, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it's it's actually for them as well so we do a full follow-up consultation yeah with them even if they don't get the job to go through it and say this is you know and and we'll give you this full report so you can take it away with you so you know kind of where you sit and what you, motivates nice. you um so i think yeah i think that it's important to keep learning and from your staff as well. I think that I'm learning all the time. I believe everyone's a work in progress and I've learned so much from my team. Um, so yeah. And you've carried on that learning journey. You're, you're now an author. So tell us a bit about that. You've got an exciting year coming up ahead, I believe. Yes. So this is like, this is an exclusive. Mm. Just so you're Dropping aware. now. Yeah. Better Never Ends podcast. Here we go. Exclusive. <laughs> um yeah so i for the last year um i've been working on a book with um vermillion which is part of penguin and um it's a book called heal your back and it's really exciting it's something i've always wanted to do um 
you know, one of the things that I've always been really conscious of is that not everyone can afford to see an osteopath or a physio. Um, and obviously, you know, there's the NHS and they're under a lot of pressure at the moment. So, um, you know, what was my way of being able to impact people f as far and wide as I could beyond my hands um, that would enable them to help themselves in a one-off affordable way? Um, and I really believe that this book does that. Well, the lovely thing is that that's where this podcast came from as well. And it's so great to hear that actually other people think that way too. And, and you've, you've done it via a book. And yeah, I do it via a podcast. But tell us then, what, what are some of the key points that you might raise from what, what might someone learn from reading your book, Heal Your Back? Um, so they're definitely going to learn lots of um, tips and tricks that they can do. So my Instagram is full of like little you know, I call them osteo tips of ways in which people can kind of help themselves at home. Um, but it really, what it does is it includes four steps for people to think about when it comes to their back pain. So that's um, sleep, it's nutrition, it's mindset and stress and movement and strength training. So it's the sort of four pillars of what we know is really important when it comes to back pain. So what are those, what are the highlights from each of those? And obviously you don't want to spoil the book and give all of it away, <laughs> but <laughs> you can give us some nuggets to draw people in. Cause actually I think that's, I was almost hoping I might disagree with you here, but <laughs> so far <laughs> this is all very much in line with the things that I might suggest that kind of, and, and actually it is news to a lot of people that it's not just about the physical. It's not just about a treatment. It's, it's a much wider perspective. So tell us a bit more then about how sleep, let's start with sleep, how does sleep affect your back? Um, so it, it goes on to, I mean, it explains how, uh, what evidence shows around sleep, that sleep is um, yeah. quite, well, very important when it comes to back pain and pain perception. Yeah. And that uh, we now know that you know, there's that cycle, right? That pain sleep cycle where people are in pain and then they can't sleep and then they um, have more pain. And and then I think there's been, there's been a study now which shows that it's actually more the sleep that impacts the pain perception than the other way around. Yeah. Um, How do you break that cycle then? If, you, if you're in too much pain to sleep properly, but you know the sleep is the main problem for your pain. So really, it's that's where little techniques come in. So, you know, I've written within the book, I've written um, ways in which people can implement a form of kind of being present mindfulness mm. with gentle movements before they go to bed. Yeah. Um, and then it's obviously preparing yourself for sleep and things like that. So yeah. sleep hygiene has become a big thing in, in, in the world of health and wellness and probably in the last 10-ish years, yeah. people suddenly realise that sleep isn't just being unconscious. There's there's a process. There's a there's a way of doing it better. If you're struggling, then the, the, there are some tips that you can do that work really well. I know one of the things I... That, that great book Matthew Walker wrote, Why We mm. Sleep, which talks... which says one of the most important things which I'd never thought of was consistent bedtime, consistent wake time. I thought it didn't really matter. As long as you get seven, eight hours, then you're okay. But you said one of the most important things for sleep health mm -hmm. and sleep hygiene is that consistent uh, t sleep time. And in previous jobs, there have been days I've had to get up really early and then days that I get back from work really late. And you think, oh, wow, that's yeah, that makes it really hard to keep up with that kind of consistency. Yeah. I imagine these are the kind of things that yeah. we're now in a place where we can advise on. As yeah. As health practitioners, we can talk about sleep as well. Yeah, definitely. What was next? Nutrition? Yes. Um so it it was it's all about um looking at the impact of things like processed foods and their their inflammatory processes um and then looking at ways in which you can implement or or make really small changes to your uh diet to try and have anti-inflammatory foods basically within it so and then it obviously covers things like supplements, whether what the evidence is behind things like turmeric or 
glucosamine is, is there, sulfate. Is there evidence there to, to be promoting it? There's only some, but not enough. Yeah. What so, do you think? Well, I've, I'm hesitant with things uh, like that. Because, yeah. And nutrition's murky anyway with, with evidence because it's such... Um, one, I mean, it's almost cliche now, but the individual differences within people make it so hard to mm. advise on mass. And it then makes a nutri- even a nutritionist's job really hard. So, you know, us as clinicians trying to talk about nutrition when it's not our primary role, it's, yeah. it's tricky. So I'm much happier to confidently sit on the fence and say, I don't know exactly how your body's going to cope with certain yeah. foods. Um, but there is some evidence that says that these foods could be anti-inflammatory, but I wouldn't be committing to them yeah. as a as an absolute hard or fast rule. Here are some other things as well. Here are some ways of thinking yeah. about it. Almost trial and error. How do you feel after doing after eating these foods? How do you feel after eating those foods? Yeah. I think. I mean, my my understanding is that if you have more plant based foods in your diet, you'll generally be better. The the, the fiber in that plant based foods is really good for you. Mm. The the other chemicals that comes the the good chemicals that comes with those foods again are really good for you. Mm. So I, I try and advise the simplicity of it the kind of mediterranean diet type thing yeah but i'm very open to saying that look the evidence is murky you might be someone who's just one of those anomalies who actually bananas spikes your glucose levels and you just yeah you're right yeah and i I think i i I literally start the chapter by saying i am not a nutritionist yeah (laughs) Yeah. So, um, and I've actually worked alongside a nutritionist for that chapter, yeah. um, for that reason. Exactly. Um, yeah. But yeah, exactly. It, and that's the thing with, with the book and with anything, right, that we do in clinic is it's kind of like, well, you know, we're all so unique beings that what works for Joe won't work for Bob. Yeah. And so. that's why I think these conversations are helpful is to, rather than saying, everyone must do this because this is what I've found that works for me or this is what I've found that works for such and such person. Just have an open conversation about the fact that actually it's really hard to make really specific advice and therefore this is information that helps you learn about yourself rather than us telling you what to do. Yeah, exactly. Okay. What about then stress? So, um, I mean, stress is a minefield. Yeah. <laughs> so it it's very much about um the role that stress has on our bodies cortisol chronic stress um how stress actually you know has its good things but also that chronic cortisol release and chronic stress isn't necessarily good and can lead to a bit of a inflammatory process within our body and also it can then lead to that pain perception and pain cycle um where there's that fear around pain and what it does and um things like that basically it's another spiral then isn't it another spiral I'm scared of my pain my pain makes me scared yeah where do you break that cycle again yeah it's a really tricky one i think um my biggest shift in knowledge around stress was reading an uh, excellent book by robert spolsky why zebras don't get ulcers it's quite old now but my god it's such a good book i absolutely love it and i'd recommend anyone who's really interested in uh, learning about stress to engage with it it's a bit technical at times but it's got such good stuff in there and it talks all about the the good side of stress yeah you know i think they use a really nice analogy of most people quite enjoy roller coasters (laughs) you know like not everyone but yeah that's a way of deliberately stressing ourselves out because we love the thrill of it yeah there's a reason why roller coasters are only two or three minutes long because once after that it becomes a, a an unpleasant experience not a pleasant experience <laughs> yeah and you get to the end of the day as you've been to the roller coaster you're like i don't want to go any more ro- roller coasters i'm quite done thanks yeah because you want a bit of a break so it's really interesting to open my eyes yeah. to this concept of positive stress you know yeah we, we do know this instinctively you know we we watch sport sometimes because we like because we find it stressful but enjoyable stress you know, yeah kind of stuff as well so it gets demonized doesn't it but we need a, a healthy level of stress in our lives to to feel I don't know, to have some kind of meaning as well. Yeah. I know that there's been periods where I think I was I was injured for for six weeks and not working and that was really dull and really actually I found that really quite depressing because I didn't have anything that was stressful in any way whatsoever. There's nothing stimulating about my life. Probably the fact that I was in pain didn't help as well. As we said, this is the pain. Yeah. It influences the stress, which influences the pain. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, in the book, I, I cover all of that sort of explaining it. Um, in a relatable way 
but then also sort of give again sort of these nuggets of information on how um people can get themselves or, or think about their pain um in a different way and then you your final topic of movement and exercise so um i'm a lover of strength training um personally uh, but also for my patients uh so i cover um the benefits of movement the evidence around it um and we know that people think posture is like the be all and end all yeah. about back pain um and we now know that evidence shows that it that that posture has nothing really yeah well it it does but it's like a very small part of back pain and, um, and the nuance is really fascinating here it's like the there's no such thing as perfect posture yeah and if you're not in pain you shouldn't be thinking about your posture at all yeah you should just be comfortable yeah and if you're uncomfortable you may have even left it a bit too long to move you should just be moving more often the one i always say to patients is the best posture is your next posture yeah yeah just there's that line movement. in it yeah and <laughs> and they and the amount of people that go oh yeah oh, okay yeah i like that and then people then come back a week after two weeks after you go it's been on my mind. It's a really yeah. catchy one. It's one of those real sticky phrases that seems it. to work. And they, they go away and they, they they relax into their posture and they, they deliberately slouch. And you go, yes, great. You know, that slouch looks excellent. You know, you're yeah. really, really encouraging people to think that posture is not the thing that should be demonized. It's, yeah. if anything, the upright, in, in, you know, in quoted uh, commas, um, inverted commas, the perfect posture, the upright one, that's the problem. Yeah. If you're spending too much time there, that's exhausting. Your muscles are having to work really hard to <laughs> yeah. hold you in that yeah. apparent perfect posture. That's the one that's going to cause you more discomfort than something yeah. just like I am in this chair here. Yeah, and me. But the amount um, of people that are really shocked by that. And that evidence now is decades old. It just takes that long to yeah. assimilate into general public. Well, um, actually, I said that on TV on this morning and they picked that one clip and they put it on their Instagram account, yeah. this morning's Instagram account. And it literally went viral, like mental. In a good way, I hope. It was it was all over, yeah. right? Because I was challenging something that people have believed for so long yeah. that obviously there was like the general public was like, that is not true. Yeah. I, that's ridiculous. She doesn't know what she's talking about, yeah. blah, blah, blah. But then what was nice was that all the clinicians were coming Pilot. in going, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were, go they were either... You know, they were commenting back on these people going, no, she's right. Yeah. Um, or they were saying, oh, thank goodness that there's finally someone like that's saying evidence based stuff on TV kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, so that was enough for me, you know, and I get that yeah. challenging someone's beliefs around stuff like that is, you know, they just can't believe it, you know. Yeah, what was what? That's why I think it's nice when people a week later probably didn't believe me when I said it, but a week later they come back, they go, oh, actually, do you know what? I'm, I've just been so much more relaxed about my posture. I feel a bit better. My back feels a bit less tight now. And you, you, you almost need them to experience it, but uh, mm -hmm. but you need that ca catchy slogan for them to go away and actually remember it. <laughs> yeah. The, the interesting part from some of that evidence though is that when you are in back pain, sometimes posture does matter. And that's the point when you have to be a bit more nuanced about it. It's like, well, if you're slumping and you've got back pain, perhaps if it's discogenic, let's say, yeah. that might actually cause you pain. That might trigger it a bit more than if you're upright. Yeah. So at that point, that's, that's when I'm more comfortable talking about posture. Mm. But if someone's got a bit of a tight back and they're just saying, oh, what, what do you think about posture? Is, is, how am I, how am I? Um, actually, no, just relax, just just relax. Into yeah. It. So it, there is nuance around it. And it's I think it's our job to promote it on a wider scale in a, in a different way, but also individually to be aware of when it might be important to someone. What do you, um, this is me asking you a question. Well, here we go. <laughs> so I find that there's a lot of negative narrative, a lot of self-blame, right? In some of my patients, very like, um, it, I know it's my fault mm. that my back hurts because I didn't stretch at the gym yeah. or I sit like this for hours at work or... Um, yeah, you know, like I'm lazy. I, you know, there's just a lot of, like I'm broken. Yeah, I just end up trying to use that the evidence that we've just spoken about, certainly from posture, and say, well, they looked at tens of thousands of people, and by the way, companies have been trying to prove that there's a perfect posture for decades. 
But unfortunately, those companies have been disappointed because all the evidence points to posture not being as important as we once thought it was. Mm. So it's not your fault because actually, if anything, I'd rather you relax and just re- and stop worrying about posture so much at all. Mm. And then the other part of it around, you know, being lazy and, and like not exercising, it's like, well, it's in, our, it's in our nature. We are genetically designed to conserve energy. It's actually really hard for us to voluntarily exercise. Mm. So that's not what we had to do. We didn't evolve for that purpose. We evolved to have to do it for our food. We don't need to do that anymore. We can mm. click an app, a couple of buttons, and our food will arrive within half an hour. Yeah. So we are pre-programmed to conserve energy, and therefore it's really hard in the modern world to actually volunteer to exercise, which is why there are some endorphins in there for some people and you get stronger releases from others. So if you're one of those people that doesn't get a massive endorphin rush from exercise, you don't really enjoy it that much, you don't have a sport, You've your parents didn't exercise all that much, I mean, it almost makes sense that you you feel lazy. Mm. but if we then explain all those things like oh right i get it so my my genetics are against me my, you know the society is against me and at that point it's well do you want to change and then it's up to them yeah so it's yeah, but yeah. it's tough it is really tough when you think of all those factors that are against people yeah and and it's about sort of i think there's very much it can especially with social media it, it comes across very much all or nothing mm. yeah and it's about reminding people that yeah. they don't need to give all. They don't need to go to the gym four times a week because so and so does. Yeah. You know, like rose tinted glasses as well. They you are only seeing the best yep. um edited version of that person's <laughs> life. You you're not 100%. seeing the day when they went, Oh, do you know what? I can't be bothered to get out of bed today. I might just miss the gym. You're not seeing the um oh God, I'm feeling a bit rough today. I'm gonna eat a hamburger you know you're not yeah. seeing that you're, they're just posting what they want you t- to see yeah. about their life and ultimately that's the way they're going to sell themselves and you yeah. understand it but once you understand that that no one is perfect and some people are maybe more health conscious than others but doesn't mean that you have to be then yeah. you can go on living your own life and thinking about yourself yeah i think that's the the important part it's that it's, it's your journey your life you think about what you want you might learn from other people but you've got to bring it back to you yeah 100 percent What's the, so there's strength training within that. You talk, you talk about posture. What else do you talk about within that movement side? Um, just sort of giving them uh, like little exercises that they can do um, easily at their desk, ways to think about movement. Um, and yeah, just also ways in which they can think about moving without having to spend any money. Yeah, incidental movement. Yeah. Or, or like free exercise and where I've put it. So it's like just yeah, things like walking up the stairs, that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I literally. There's so much to be said for that, that. Yeah. If because even people who exercise a bit but sit all day, it's quite hard actually to get the health benefits from almost the antidote to sitting. But if you do more of that incidental movement, then it's way more powerful. The getting up and moving, even just walking to get some water. There's there's yeah. a lot to be said for that. Yeah, I I um when I do like some talks for corporate companies or whatever, I say, um, I actually encourage people to use a glass to have water, mm. so that you have to go and fill it up. Yeah. Um, rather than big water bottles. Yeah, and I think everyone will. <laughs> you, you blame you. You got it. You got your eye on my big water bottle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's the size of my torso, literally. <laughs> Could be your shin. Yeah, probably. I, and I think. I think that's a, a fair point. You know, when people are sitting, and I'm lucky I've got a job where I move around all the time so I can get away with a big water bottle. But yeah, if you are sitting for 8, 10, 12 hours, yeah. an exercise session might not quite be enough to optimize your health in those situations. Yeah. So finding ways where you can bring movement in, I think that's that's a really nice phrase rather than exercise. Is can you just move a bit more? Yeah. And this is where the 10,000 hours, uh, not 10,000 10, steps can, can be so powerful if you get someone who just goes do you know what i'm gonna nail that step goal no matter what i do and although the evidence isn't necessarily that it must be ten thousand hours i think even seven and eight is really powerful isn't it yeah um but whatever that arbitrary number might be it just gets people moving a bit exactly gets it on their mind my mum literally oh she's so obsessed with that ten thousand steps thing my dad's the same i bought my fitbit about five years ago and he's i don't (laughs) think he's missed ten thousand steps since well that's epic though isn't it yeah, he's retired, so you know. yeah, <laughs> he just walks all day. What What do you think is better never ends in your world now? You've you've 
given us a really good flavor of the diversity of your life and you're a business owner and osteopath uh, you you get yourself on tv and you're a real promoter of your of your work and, and your industry but from here on in what does the future look like and what does better never ends mean to you within that frame so if i was to think about better never ends i would say that to me it means of evolution mm-hmm. um so adapting um because i believe the world around us is constantly changing and it's good to change with it um even if it feels uncomfortable um so i'd say that that's probably what better never ends to me um and in terms of the future for myself yeah just grow uh personally in business um and learn constantly learning and you've found quite clearly from what you've said so far you found that even in those toughest times it's been an opportunity to learn and to grow and that seems to have ended up being a net positive is that something you're now you're almost you seem more more comfortable to go into the unknown and to to put yourself out there and, and face some of the critique that you get but you know that in the end it will make you better is that right yeah um I think, you know, it's fair to say that when you're in those moments, it can be quite a dark place. But I have that ability now to sort of step backwards and look at it and go, you survived. And actually, look how much you've grown and learned from that one experience. So it's one of my favorite quotes is, um, failure is not when you fall, but when you fail to get back up again. And I've kind of lived my life like that. So, yeah. So if someone wants to learn a bit more about you, where would they find you? They can find me at Osteo Anisha on Instagram. Um, I'm on TikTok as well, at Osteo Anisha. And uh, website is osteoallies.co.uk. And your new book? Heal Your Back, already um, available for pre-order on Amazon. When do you think that might be out? It's not out till October, so it's a while away. Um, Get that pre-order in now then. Yeah, do it. It's worth the wait. Well, I'll read it. I'll definitely be reading it. I used to have back pain, so I'll be looking back and if I have it again, then I'll know what to do. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Thanks so much, Anisha, for coming in. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. And I think there's there's a lot. In fact, I'm going to take a lot from this because I know I really struggle with the person, the public speaking I know people would be like, well, hang on, you're on a podcast, but I'm talking to you. I've got one person in front of me and I've got another person behind the cameras and doing doing that. So it doesn't feel like I'm talking to a big group of people. So I think I'll take a lot from that. and Maybe I'll start counting colours. I think that'll be a nice little tick, a nice little, um, a nice little uh, uh, bit of advice that I can take on and do myself. So thanks very much for the personal advice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so glad you took that away. Um and honestly, I think everything you're doing is so amazing. So, can we um, get this bit out because it's making me feel uncomfortable? I know that's <laughs> why I'm doing it. Um, but yeah, no, you're doing incredible things. So, um, thanks for inviting me on. Oh, on that embarrassing note, thanks very much. <laughs> thanks for listening to today's podcast. This podcast is sponsored by Better, provider of health, wellness, and performance services based in central London. You can book in for face-to-face services at either of our two clinics, one in Soho and one in the city. You can also follow us on Instagram at Better Never Ends or head over to our website for more information about the clinics or the podcast at www.betterneverends.com. And of course, if you want to send us an email with any feedback, questions or suggestions for future episodes, then email us on podcast at betterneverends.com. And finally, thanks to Brian Long for editing the show. Without him, it's absolutely no doubt in my mind that these would never have seen the light of day. And um, it will allow this podcast to continue on for as long as I'll keep recording them. So thanks very much, Brian.